Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Sports and Society Dialogues, an initiative of the Sports Law and Policy Center in collaboration with BIC, where we explore issues at the intersection of sports, law, and policy in society. Today's topic is on the making of sporting cultures, of history, imperialism, and colonial responses. I'm happy to introduce you to our speakers for this evening. We have Dr. Rona Joy Sen, Senior Research Fellow at the South Asian Studies Program, National University of Singapore. He has a PhD in political science from the University of Chicago and studied history at Presidency College, Calcutta. He has held a visiting fellowships at the National Endowment for Democracy, Washington, DC, East West Center, Washington, DC, and the International Olympic Museum in Lausanne, Switzerland. He's also worked with leading Indian newspapers for over a decade, most recently as an editor for the Times of India. Dr. Sen regularly writes for newspapers, journals, and is also the author of the books titled Articles of Faith, Religion, Secularism, and the Indian Supreme Court, and his latest book, Nation at Play, A History of Sport in India. Our next speaker is Professor Mike Cronick, who is Academic Director of Boston College, Ireland. He was educated at the University of Kent and was awarded his DFA at Oxford University. He has published widely on the various aspects of Irish history and is a renowned scholar in the area of sport. He is the regular media commentator on aspects of Irish sporting history. Professor Cronin has developed a series of major public history projects based around topics of Irish relevance, including the 2008-12 Gaelic Athletic Association or a history project, and is developing a major online repository of real-time history project for the Irish Decade of Centenaries, Century Ireland. Our moderator for this evening is Shubham Jain, a research fellow at the Sports Law and Policy Centre. He's also a legal advisor to Fair Game UK and is also assisting with editing of the Handbook of Mega Sporting Events and Human Rights at the Centre for Sport and Human Rights. In October 2022, he will begin his PhD at the University of Cambridge, where he will explore the role of law and policy in improving access and inclusion in sports, with a particular focus on cricket in India, South Africa, and the UK. Welcome to all of our speakers. Before we begin, if any of our viewers have any questions during the sessions, please type them in the question box in the Zoom toolbar, and our speakers will try to address some of your questions before the end of the session. I will now hand over to Shivam to take forward this discussion. Thanks, Agita, and thanks also to BIC uh, for hosting the session and SLPC for organizing the session. I mean, uh, sport occupies a vital part of our lives for many of us. Uh, we follow our favorite teams and players obsessively. Sometimes we even structure our daily lives and schedules around uh, sport matches and events. In this fast moving cycle of modern sports, we often get little time to think about sports beyond the field. Why is the sport played the way it is? Uh, why are specific sports played in certain parts of the world? What do we mean when we talk about a culture of sports? Our panelists today have thought deeply about these questions. Uh, Professor Cronin uh, developed the Gaelic Athletic Association's oral history project, which tried to understand the complex history and contribution of an organization which was established to preserve and promote the uniqueness of Irish games. The project also looked at how the GA continues to influence Irish sports, culture, and society, and what it means for Irish, both home and abroad. Dr. Sain has produced a wonderful book about how Indians have engaged with sports since ancient times and how various political, cultural, and social developments over the past years have transformed our relationship with sports. In particular, he has contrasted how cricket, a colonial sport, was adopted by Indians as its own, while several local games and sports were sent down a path of obscurity. In this session, with the help of our panelists, we'll try to examine the role of history, imperialism, and anti-colonial struggles in shaping sports and sporting cultures. Welcome to the Sports and Society Dialogues, Professor Tronin and Dr. Sain. Uh, to begin with, uh, I think I'd like to ask both of you about how these respective projects came about, a little more detail about the projects, and what were your professional and personal influences which inspired you to undertake these projects? If I may invite Professor Tronin first. Oh, thank you. Yeah, the Gaelic Athletic Association, or the GAA, uh, was founded in 1884. Um, I'll explain a bit about that in a moment. But the project came about in um, 2008, specifically to celebrate the 125th anniversary of the GAA. Um, my interest as a historian was very much that here was Ireland's largest sports organization. So basically one in five people in on the island of Ireland is a member of the GAA. Um, 
if you looked at its history to that point, it was like many sports organisations, its history was dominated by, you know, political interfaces, um, great players, great teams, a very kind of traditional sporting history. The one thing I was particularly interested in is because the GAA is not a professional organisation, its players are still, even in 2022, amateur. Um, you have amateur players playing the final in the two games, Gaelic football and hurling, in Europe's fourth biggest stadium. So 83,500 people will pay to watch amateurs, which is quite unusual. And really what you understand is this is a, this is a, a sporting organisation which, over a century old, relies on community and volunteer efforts. So if you drive around the country, every village, every town has its GEA clubs. Um, but everything is, is volu voluntary. So really the idea behind your own history project was to say, OK, let's move beyond the field of play, if you like. If we have sport functioning as a social organisation, a civic organisation, why do people buy into this? So we set out to interview people across Ireland and then amongst the Irish diaspora. In the end, we interviewed around 1,800 people. Uh, the archive, which is online, runs to something like 40,000 hours of interviews. Um, and it was to try and understand people's relationship to sport generally, but in this specific case, the Gaelic Athletic Association, and what it actually means to people. Um, and that could be social, it could be communal, could be how their family tied in with it. And obviously in the Irish situation, it was the very specific question of why Gaelic games? Why have you bought into this specific game that basically nobody else in the world plays? And if they know about it, they probably don't care about it. Um, so, you know, how do you, how do people, especially, you know, we, we interviewed the oldest person, I think we interviewed 106 all the way down to sort of somebody in their um, late teens. It's that notion of how does identity form, emerge, how do people think about it when they live in the sort of world of global sport? You know, soccer, rugby, cricket, all these things are bombarded onto the television. Why was their primary relationship with the GAA? Um, which speaks to traditional sports. And just to finish this section, um, I think for people who don't know about the GAA, it critically works in the 1880s as a moment where, if you understand the modern sporting revolution begins some point in the 1860s, um, Ireland is part of Britain at that point, that line empire, um, was being bombarded, literally, or importing uh, British games. So the games that were really kind of um, flourishing in Ireland at that point were cricket. Cricket was huge in Ireland in the 19th century. Um, rugby had arrived and soccer had arrived. And basically what happened was people who were cultural and political nationalists argued that if in sport, as with many other things, Irish people just continue to consume British culture, then being Irish was, was a nothing. So Michael Cusack, who founded the GAA, specifically set out to invent or to recall Irish sports for Irish men. So he argued there was two main games, hurling, which is a stick and ball game, um, which has it's been played for about 2,000 years, very traditional Irish game. And Gaelic football, which he claimed was very old, but it wasn't. Um, it was an invention and it's very much, it's a handling and kicking game. It's very much a mixture between soccer and rugby. But it means that what you have is this slight twist of Ireland having an indigenous sport, a traditional sport, if you like, um, but being set up in 1884 when there's been enough knowledge of how sports organisations work to create two team sports that are very, very popular. And I think, that's, again, that's one thing we may come back to in the discussion. Why do some sports work and some sports don't? Sports have got to be good to watch. Um, it's got to be part of your cultural upbringing. I watch an American football game, kind of leaves me quite cold. Why? I'm not, I, I didn't grow up with it. I'm not used to it. Um, but also, I, I personally don't find it interesting to watch, it's too complex. Whereas you think about the kind of more normally, typically global games that are very, very popular, you know, golf, tennis, soccer, wherever you want to go, they're incredibly simple. 
You know, the idea is to beat an opponent or to get a ball in goal from point A to point B. Uh, and I think that's important in the Irish case. Yes, you have this kind of retrofitted indigenous game, but it's being built in a very modern, consumable form. Thank you so much for that. That's very helpful to know. Uh, if I may ask uh, Dr. Sain to sort of talk about in similar ways about your project. Right. So I don't have a you know, as uh, complex and interesting uh, an explanation as Mike did. Uh, you know, like many in in this gathering, uh, you know, I've been a sort of passionate follower of sports since my uh, childhood days. Um, but you know, um, you, know, you saw my bio. You know, I'm of course a political scientist by training. But besides my identity as a political scientist, I also spent you know over a decade, you know, almost twelve or thirteen years in in Indian newspapers, starting off with Telegraph in Calcutta and then the Times of India. And during my stint in the Times of India editorial page, when I was in Delhi, uh, you know, you are expected to, in, 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 in journalism to write about different things. So even if you have a specialization, you kind of willy nilly become a jack of all trades. And uh, one of the things I used to quite frequently write, you know, the, the unsigned edit pieces was on, 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 on sports. So, sort of my you know, passion in sports and this sort of uh, you know, developing you know, sort of professional expertise, if you might call it, in writing, in, in edits on sports, sort of made me think about you know, hist of writing a history of sport. And of course, as many of you are aware, there are you know, fine books on the history of Indian cricket. In fact, one going back to the 1830s, written, written by this Parsi gentleman uh, called uh, Shapurji Sarabji, who talks about the struggle between cricket and polo in the Maidans of, of, of Bombay. And of course, in the past you know, three decades, you had some great books, including by you know, Bangalore's own Ramachandra Guha and, and several others. Uh, but uh, I did see uh, a lacuna or a gap in, in, a, in a history of sports that, you know, of course, looked at cricket, but also looked at the other sports and sort of went back you know, in time and sort of took a long gray view. So, so to address this gap and combined, as I said, with my interest in sport, I think that's how the project, the book project, uh, which culminated in the book uh, Nation at Play uh, came about. And I must add, before concluding, that uh, the situation has changed, you know, since you know, I wrote my book. I, I don't ascribe the change to my book, but I think it was a coincidence that uh, since the book came out, I think that was in 2015, you now see a lot more books on the other sports. We see books on wrestling, we see books on boxing in India, books on badminton. Uh, many of them are biographies of uh, famous sports person, but there are others that look at the sport in general, both historically as well as sociologically. Um, and also, I might add what you see, you know, besides these sort of written products, you see a lot of uh, you know, films now being made. You know, some of them might be average, some of them are quite good, but the fact is that there are more films being made, uh, Hindi films being made, uh, as well as in, in, in regional cinema on sporting events, on sporting heroes. So that too, I think there's been a diversification sort of beyond cricket. In fact, in the cricket films have somehow not been very popular, except I would say Lagan, which was somewhat different, it wasn't a typical cricket film in that sense. I think some of the, uh, the films or biopics on other sports have actually been more popular than the ones on cricket. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's definitely true. In fact, I can't even remember, I think apart from 83 in the recent times, no other cricket film has sort of been that popular probably. But no, that's very uh, helpful to know from both of you as to how these projects came about and a bit of a history in terms of uh, the GA particularly because uh, a lot of the members of the audience might not know about it. So we'll obviously come to these uh, projects and discussion a bit more in detail, specifically about cricket and about uh, Gaelic sports. But before that, I think I'll want to start by sort of a discussion on your understanding of what you think is meant by sporting cultures, because that is sort of what we're trying to sort of think about in this session. So is it is it something to do with, uh, so when we say that a country has a sporting culture or a culture in a particular uh, sport, uh, 
do we seem to understand uh, in terms of whether the country has uh, elite level success in that sport or that a lot of people uh, from that country or or society or community follow a particular sport or support it or that it is about participation in in a particular sport or sport generally or something else or a combination of these what what do we sort of understand when we talk about sporting culture um that's a very big 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 question um i think there's, there are distinctions i think you make the correct distinction between participation and spectatorship um that you know in a lot of the world participation rates are going down not everywhere but i mean i think you know the the the, the kind of the tradition of participation of uh kind of playing sport as a pastime or in kind of local leagues etc um i think the future of that's unclear because i do think the kind of the media juggernaut at least fetching this probably since the 1990s and the sort of advent of the digital age um has really taken sport into a whole new stratosphere um which is so far removed now from participation i think the idea that if you go back to you know maybe the decades after second world war where you know if you played soccer you played cricket you went to the local ground to watch a game there was some kind of commonality that these people weren't earning you know massive fortunes for playing they were in all likelihood kind of working class people like the spectators um therefore you know you played soccer on a sunday and you watched it on a saturday it's kind of the same activity whereas clearly in the world of the premier league and la liga serie a etc the distance between the participant and um sorry the player and the spectator is is, is a massive gulf um i think the idea of a sporting culture um I think there's the the again they they kind of break down in my mind to sort of very different things. I think there's a global passion for sport. Uh you know, you get those people who, you know, will watch the Olympics, you'll watch the World Cup, you'll watch your local league or your local sport. So, you know, if you're in South Africa for the sake of argument, you'll mo- you'll mostly be interested in cricket rugby. You know, if you're in Australia it's Aussie rules cricket rugby rugby league. So some of it's national some of it's regional. Um I think the idea of a culture though is I think it's really trying to understand again to my mind it's the passive and the active. So I think again there's a big distinction I I personally go to a live sporting event maybe twice a year. Okay? I'm interested I work on it. If you ask me who won match X at the weekend I could probably tell you. Okay? Um but that's been mediated to me. that's me online that's me watching tv that's not me kind of performatively consuming and we slip into that thing of sporting culture i think also drifts then into the idea of the fan you know the idea that the person who wakes up on saturday morning if it's soccer to go through a whole series of rituals that gets them to the ground with their friends with some drink with some food they stand or they sit in the same place or they have the excitement of the away game they are kind of this has real meaning to them this is something that is repeated week in week out throughout their lives quite often on the back of their father did it their grandfather did it their grandmother did it whoever in the family this is real meaningful personal and community stuff and that is radically different to my experience of sport So I think when you talk about sports culture you've got to take a very kind of multifaceted view of it that the way people consume sport will really kind of stratify how they relate to it. Um and I think again it's, it's, I know I'm always confused about the kind of the, the onslaught of digital media in recent years where in a way there's more sport everywhere and yet in some ways less people are watching it and yet, again i think the one thing when we talk about the sports world or we talk about sports culture we've got to remember a lot of people simply don't care um and therefore what we're talking about when we we really got to think about who's involved in this world i think the great thing about sports culture uh is a very simple idea it's the one space in life in things we consume where you don't know what's going to happen 
you know, if I go and watch a, a, a movie, once I've established it's a thriller and there's a James Bond type character, although he's going to go through lots of awful things, he's going to win in the end. He's going to come through and succeed. Um, you know, if I go and watch a play, unless it's a brand new play, I know what's going to happen. I can look online and read a review from the night before and some say, oh, it's really good and this person does this and I know what's going to happen. If I sit down to watch a horse race, a golf game, a soccer match, a cricket match, I do not know who's going to win. And I think it's that culture of the pure kind of excitement, the unexpected and so on, that really feeds into it, into it as well. So I think it's the form. I think it's understanding the different ways different groups of people relate to it. And my final point is this one, when you talk about sports culture, this is something that's built and developed and has a relevance over, you know, roughly speaking, 150 years. But from the modern sporting revolution in Victorian Britain and outwards, this is something that's been a constant and yet has always managed to be relevant to different societies. And I think that's why you can look at certain things like perhaps boxing. I know boxing still generates huge amounts of money, but, you know, in real terms, boxing probably in decline. Why? Because as a society, we think two people smashing each other over the head isn't a good thing. We're having a moral problem with it in the way the Victorians had a moral problem with animal sports. Whereas I think the major team sports around the world, apart from debates maybe in American football and rugby about concussion, They've continued, they've adapted, they've met the digital revolution, they met TV a generation before that. Sports adaptability also feeds into the permanent, well, maybe not permanence, but the longevity of its culture. Um, yeah, no, that was a fairly comprehensive sort of answer and I don't have too much to add, but I like the distinction that Mike uh, made between uh, you know, watching or consumer sport and participating in sports. So I think sporting culture I would say encompasses both in both the spectatorship as well as the participatory aspect. And as Mike said, you know, many of us are passionate about sport, but many of us again do not really physically go to see or watch uh, a game. You know, unless you have young kids, uh, my kid is just, is now over twenty one. But uh, you know, you then you do, you know, at that stage of life, I think watch. You know, sort of, you know, sort of children you know, participating in school games or club games. So, so that is a sort of different kind of world, you know, compared to sort of the professional uh, in sport that we that we are attuned to watching. But I just want to make a quick point here when we talk about sporting culture, which again, you know, like political culture in, in the other sort of field that I study, can be quite fuzzy. At, at, at one level, it can also be quite all encompassing of, of the other. So it covers you know, various diverse uh, aspects of, of one phenomenon. Uh, but sporting culture is often used, and particularly in India also, to talk about, uh, you know, sort of linking it to national identity, you know, whether X, Y, Z country has, has a sporting tradition, has a sporting culture. And so that's also one way in, in which that is used. And in fact, you know, when I was writing my book, in you know, one of the things that I was sort of arguing for, even though it was mostly a narrative book and it didn't really have a sort of holding sort of theoretical framework. But one of the things that I came across, and you know, many of you would have come across this in, in different forms, is the assertion that, uh, which was made by a, you know, a famous Indian sports administrator called Ashwini Kumar, who was quite intimately associated with the Olympic movement the effect, and I think this originally said it in Hindi, but uh, translated as saying that sport basically is against the Indian ethos or the Indian cultural tradition. That was a point that uh, Ashwini Kumar had made. And my book, in a way, was sort of an, a, a response to that saying, you know, that's you can't really make you know blanket statements of that. Of course, that was such statement was tied as is by you know when similar statements are made by others in India linked to India's poor performance in international competition. So it's often kind of, you know, people resort to that sort of cultural stereotype. You know, Indians can't, you know, they don't have a sport in ethos, hence, you know, they are not good at sport. So I think there is that aspect to it, you know, sort of a national character, national identity, 
which one could link to to this sort of umbrella category of uh, sporting culture. Uh, yeah, thank you for that sort of comprehensive uh, discussion on that. Uh, I and I think uh, the whole sort of bit about sport on the one side being uh, something that's quite uncertain, which is what uh, Professor uh, Cronin pointed out, and the fact that it's so intricately related to nationality is something that sort of makes it quite unique if we sort of compare it to any other human activity in that sense, right? Because uh, nowhere else probably uh, I can think of where you sort of divide activity on the basis of nationality in the way that we do in sports and nobody, no other field sort of can sort of boast that they are uh, day in and day out. What they do is so uncertain that uh, keeps up the excitement and people engage. Uh, so I think that sort of background is helpful in understanding uh, why we sort of have this discussion in terms of how these cultures are built and how these cultures came about to be the way that they are uh, in present uh, or how they might develop in future, for instance. So I think uh, it might be helpful to sort of look back a bit in terms of how the society has engaged with sport in terms of where does the modern idea of sport originate uh, and how it reaches the way it is today. Uh, we talked about how the digital age sort of in the past uh, 20 or 30 years has completely transformed the idea of sport in terms of making it sort of more distinctive between the participant and the viewer. But going even beyond that, if sort of you like to discuss a bit on where does this idea originate generally in Ireland, in India, particularly and uh, how this came to be uh, transformed from just a pastime or people just playing among themselves to something that is sort of being traded in millions and a lot of people are watching and it's, it's a big business sort of. I think that will be helpful to sort of understand a bit more. I mean, just think, I'll, I'll, I'll start with Ireland and then kind of maybe build it out. I mean, I think the whole idea of team sports particularly um, emerging in the Victorian era in um, the UK, when include Ireland in that, is to do with leisure time. That you have just, you know, there's a series of historical kind of moments. Um, the creation of leisure time would be one kind of urbanization in Britain, all those kind of big building blocks that allow various forms of leisure, and it's not just sport to take place. I think what's interesting is that you have a situation whereby. Um, the spread of sport um, is not, I think it's, it's not just a participatory level, it's also the creation of spectatorship, that when sport becomes commercialised or it's a performative way of Britishness taking place around, you know, imperial, um, the imperial world. Um, and I think what happens is that you have built into that because, again, step back, um, where the origins of the major team sports emerge from the public schools, that you have various notions of kind of masculinity and behavior that are built into sport. Um, you know, following yours as the captain, obeying the referee and the rules. It's about order, it's about gentleness. Um, and I think when you look at that, switching to the Irish situation, the Irish situation is quite radical that somebody sits there and says, I'm going to kind of reboot these ancient Irish sports so that people are Irish, not British. Um, and yet within that, they completely accept the idea of rules, masculinity, gentleness, etc. And interestingly, in, in the Irish case, amateurism as a purest form of sport. And I think that's been one interesting thing about the kind of historical growth of sport is that Yes, it changes in many ways, mainly external factors such as the media, okay. radio, TV, newspapers, digital, etc. But the core of sport, I think the interesting thing is when you kind of move forward through the spread of sport, is the way that we can look now at this multi billion dollar industry, um, which has all the things you touched on kind of identity, nationalism, regionalism, internationalism wrapped around it.
um, eye-watering transfer ch um, charges, eye-watering um, incomes, etc., etc. And yet, at the end of every game, round of applause, we all shake hands. God forbid anybody is offensive towards the umpire or the referee. But we have a sporting form that, at one level, if I took somebody from the 1870s and dropped them into 2022 to an EPL game or an IPL game, it would be completely unrecognisable to them at the way the media, the razzmatazz of the players, but there would be certain core elements that would be familiar. The games don't look that different. It's still somebody hitting a cricket ball, amassing some runs, the other person trying to beat them. But there's still codes of bodily behaviour, there's still codes of gentleness, gentleness, there's still codes of order, of obeying the referee and so on, the rules, the importance of rules, governing bodies. So I think it's, it's an interesting idea that for all the historical ways that sports emerges and then change, many of the founding principles are exactly as they were at the outset. But in a way, we're now in the 21st century living with or performing notions of Victorian masculinity. Um, and that's, I think, one of the kind of the interesting things about sport, that it's for all the kind of I was talking earlier about the unpredictability of the score, who's going to win, we also know the certain things that are red line issues. You know, you don't walk up and thump the umpire in the face. That's going to be the end of your career. And it's, I, I don't know, it's, I think it's the orderliness, the kind of long legacies about the way sport is performed are very, very important. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, Mike has very rightly pointed out to the to you know the the, the centrality of leisure, you know, um, the, the sort of notion of leisure and leisure time, which is which is a necessity, a corollary for the growth of growth of sport, and that sort of tied to you know nineteenth century, in, you know, Britain as well as Europe, where you know you have the industrial revolution taking place, you have the uh, you know, five day weeks, you have the notion of leisure for for the workers, so you have games, etc. on Saturday, Sunday being sort of the day to go to church, etc. You don't really have, you know, something similar happening in India. You, know, you don't have that sort of abrupt rupture. You do have industries appearing, but not in the way that it happens in, in, in Europe and, and Britain. Uh, so I think in India, the, the process is far more gradual. You know, initially, it's only the elites who, who have the time to take up various sports and you know, in my book, I sort of go back to the to the epics, uh, to the Mahabharata, and you know, it's it's basically the, the princely class, the, the court around the ruler, which is usually you know taking part in pastimes like you know, archery, hunting, etc. And you don't really have much by way of accounts of you know, so-called commoners doing that. But over time, of course, you do have so um, so it's a complicated process, and I think once the British introduce in that long 19th century you know, various sports, uh, we do see, uh, you know, initially the elites, the princely classes, initially, and then subsequently the middle classes. And there's a slow percolation, you know, through different sort of strata of Indian society. And it's, 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 again, happens over time. It's not a, not a sudden process. Second thing I, I found, uh, you know, what Mike was, was very interested in saying that, you know, there is also that sort of, code of conduct, right? Um, where um, you know, after a hard fought game, usually you, know, you shake hands and you always have some recalcitrants who <laughs> might not do so, but they are usually penalized. So you also have systems of penalizing you know, people who don't abide by that code. And here, you know, I probably, you know, I'd like to refer to a, a quite interesting work by the sociologist Norbert Elias, who's worked on, on, on different aspects, but he's also worked on sports and how he sort of describes it as a gradual civilizing process, and I'm sort of using Elias's words. And he talks about how, you know, sport in a way is a symbolic representation of, uh, you know, non-violent, non-military forms of competition. So, you know, two or three centuries ago, there was much more tolerance for, for bloodletting, you know, more violent kind of sports. And, you know, Mike mentioned how in, in, in the in Victorian society, there was a sort of turning away from animal sports, which often could be quite wild and bloody. Uh, 
And so, you know, I think Elias is, you know, a, a, a idea. I kind of like this idea where, you know, there is this gradual sort of um, transformation from the, you know, sort of the violent uh, you know, nature of sports to a more rule-bound, code-bound sports. And you can see that in, you know, sports like, you know, Mike mentioned boxing, right? Uh, boxing was, uh, you know, a, quite a bloody affair, you know, in sort of, even back in the 60s, 70s, you know, when you had someone like Muhammad Ali, you know, and in fact, you know, Ali, you know, uh, later in his life suffered from, uh, you know, the sort of grievous blows. And in fact, there's, I think, one particular, uh, you know, sort of blow in the ring, which you know, Angus uh, put forward, I think it was a Joe Frazier punch that, you know, had Ali's, you know, I think, head turning almost 90 degrees, which might have been one of the primary contributions later to the you know, sort of disabilities that he suffered from. So even boxing now, you know, at least uh, not in, in sort of professional boxing, but in Olympic uh, boxing, we do have these head guards and uh, you know, things like that. So there is a process of trying to make you know, sport as sort of you know, sanitized and, and, and less bloody uh, over time. So I think that's also important in the way sports not only gets transformed, but also gets I think popularized beyond a, a sort of certain group, both sort of elites as well as the professionals. And you can see the certain same thing happening in sports like wrestling, which could be very violent at, at one point uh, and life-threatening. But now, you know, when you watch uh, Olympic wrestling, you, know, you don't really see major injuries. Of course, professional wrestling is a different ball game. Much of it is <laughs> staged, one would argue when people are thrown out of the ring, et cetera. But by and large, I think most sports have put in place, you know, different safeguards, different rules to make it, you know, both safe for the participant as well as, you know, more palatable to the, to the consumer or the spectator. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's very sort of enlightening in terms of how the culture has developed and how the history has developed and how I think the overall idea being that sport takes from the society as well as I think the society taking it from the sport in terms of how uh, the whole civilizing mission sort of or the rights mission that we have see, seen in the recent sort of years in trying to make sports more safe, which is sports borrowing from how we sort of view that society should be and that nobody should be hurting uh, or uh, leading to a situation where somebody is is grievously hurt in participating in, in a leisure activity. And also I think sports impacting the society in, in other ways. So both an upstream and a downstream in that way. So I think that once we have sort of discussed and established that, and now I think is when we can come to the specific context of uh, sport and colonialism and imperialism and how uh, whatever has happened in the past sort of 200 or 300 years in both Ireland and India can be can be discussed as a case of uh, political interference in sports, so to say. Like what we are speaking now is more of a sort of custodian interference or the society sort of engaging with the sport. But I think what makes things interesting is how the politics interact with the sport and how uh, whoever is the sort of ruling or the governing class of the day try to use sport as a mechanism to sort of achieve their own ends. And uh, probably I'll invite uh, Dr. Sain first this time to sort of give give a background on how uh, the British tried to use sports as a medium and how the sort of people responded and what their interaction sort of led to and how that uh, leads us to certain sports becoming popular and certain sports uh, being lost to, to history. Right, yeah, okay. I don't mind going first this time. Uh, you know. Mike has already talked about, you know, sort of the, the ethics, and you know, particularly in, in Victorian England, you had the sort of code of masculinity and, and being sort of sporting, etc. And these were ideas which were, you know, transported across the globe by, by, by you know, through the medium of the British Empire. And in my, you know, book, in my work, I've sort of identified, at least in the Indian, or this could be, you know, even generalizable sort of in the imperial context, uh, so sort of three main kind of vehicles of you know, how sport is spread through the British Empire. And one is by by the military uh, and soldiers, you know, 
which I think you find accounts by British soldiers themselves, but by writers too, that you know, most soldiers would carry with the gun you know, probably uh, uh, a cricket bat or a soccer ball. So that was one way, you know, uh, the, the, the the British army or the military was taking their, uh, you know, the sports that they played to different parts of the world. Uh, so initially they were playing amongst themselves, then that would be picked up by by the, the natives of the indigenous people where they were posted, etc. The second medium were, were the clubs, you know, so you had uh, sort of the British clubs all across India, the in so-called gymkhanas, uh, but then quite quickly the Indian, uh, the, the middle classes, the Indian professionals also started aping these. So for instance, in, in India, very early on, you had the Parsis, who were of course uh, an Anglophile community and also quite wealthy. They were forming cricket clubs back um, in the 1860s, 70s. But quite quickly, you also had um, you know, clubs, football clubs, and soccer clubs, uh, you know, formed by you know, uh, sort of Bengali professionals or even Bengali middle classes and springing up in, 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 in Calcutta, Bengal, and then you find it elsewhere. So the clubs were also a, 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 a you know, vital medium for spreading spreading sport. And finally, you had the you had the, the public schools, uh, uh, which were really sort of I think at the forefront uh, uh, of spreading you know, sport and the sort of Victorian ethic around uh, around sport. And um, you know this uh, uh, you can see you know across India. You know, so all the public schools like. Mayo, Rajkumar College, you know, Atkinson's College in, 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 in Lahore, etc. Uh, and at the forefront, you have these uh, these uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of colonial educationist principles of colleges. So, for instance, you know, for someone like Ranji, you know, the great Ranjit Singhji, after whom India's premier cricket tournament is named. Of course, he never really played for India. He represented England because he was playing his this sort of cricket in the sort of end of the 19th century. Um, he learned his cricket in Rajkumar College in, in, in Rajkot and was schooled by this, uh, by this uh, principal of, of Rajkumar College, a man named Chester McNutt. And then again, you had someone like this missionary in, in Tyndale Bisco, uh, who was very prominent in spreading soccer and other uh, British sports like rowing in Kashmir. So you had these these figures who were also, I think, at the forefront of, of spreading this ethic. And you know, this was important because uh, sport was made part of the, the educational curriculum. So even if you did not want to, and you have records of a lot of uh, the elites and Indian princes in particular, they had they wanted nothing to do with physical activities, but they were literally forced to do so uh, by by this British adventure. So I would say that there's a sort of three sort of locus or loci of you know, in sports, the, the, the soldiers slash military, the clubs, initially British, but then you know, the Indians were aping it, and then the public schools. And, and, and I think to build on that, I think Ranjio Ranj made a perfect point. I mean, one thing about the history of sport and his, sport now is essentially it's institutionalized, that you have in the Victorian era the realization that if you want to play your cricket regularly or your soccer or whatever game it might be you've got to be organized so you do have this touch on there the organization of clubs the impact of schools which is a fixed setting um, colleges and so on clearly in terms of the longer kind of political question is once you have clubs you have governing bodies so you know, quite often through history, largely unelected people run sports. And I think what happened, I mean, just to dwell on the Irish case for a moment, obviously, the colleague, former colleague of mine, the rugby historian, Tony Collins, who's looked at football codes around the world, he makes a, a, his kind of historical answer in a way to the question of why do different nations play different sports? His answer's always been, in a way, whatever arrives first. So if cricket arrives first or rugby, whatever the game may be, that's probably the one that's closest tied to the national culture. And you can see that, you know, one of the clear examples is the dominance of New Zealand rugby over New Zealand cricket, for example. Um, Ireland's an unusual case because cricket, rugby, soccer were all alive and well and living in Ireland before the GAA was even dreamt of as an idea. 
Uh, it comes in explicitly, as I've said, to uh, be a performative sporting part of Irish nationalist culture in a very political capital P sense. Um, and amazingly, within the first 16 years of existence, by the end of um, the 1800s, the GEA has become the biggest sport in Ireland. It's completely destroyed cricket. It takes cricket and nearly 100 years to recover. Um, rugby retreats into elite schools and doesn't really have the strength outside of those. Uh, and soccer relies on pretty much the major cities on the island, namely Belfast and Dublin, and are largely linked to works teams. Okay. Why does the GEA work so well? It does something, I think, it's quite unique in sporting culture in that political act. In the 1890s, it introduces a ban on its members playing or watching any British sport. So, and that's a clear challenge. In kind of nationalist political context, that's a clear challenge. You're either with us, the GAA, and you're marking yourself as Irish, or you're with them. And if you're playing soccer or watching soccer, you're identifying yourself with the imperial overlord with Britain. And once you give people, it's very date specific, but once you give people that clear choice, if they feel themselves as Irish and nationalist, then yes, they'll play Gaelic games, they will reject the British sports. Now in Ireland, that has managed to sort of perpetuate itself. Um, the Irish Soccer League now is very small. If you're anywhere halfway decent, you'll go and play in England or somewhere else. Um, but politics in the Irish setting has always been there because the GAA has been avowedly politi political. Interestingly, and moving beyond Ireland, the GAA, its rule book says it's an a non-political or apolitical organisation, which is true of every, pretty much every sports organisation. And yet again, herein lies one of the kind of complete you know, contradictions within sport that we talk about this good thing in our society. It keeps people fit and healthy and gives them a sense of identity. It brings them together in a community. And yet it's one of the biggest political forces in the world. Um, and what I mean by that is, and I think it works at different levels, you have a game, even if it's a shared game, soccer, cricket, whatever it may be, where the performativity in and around that game becomes national. That the IPL looks Indian, county cricket looks English. It's the same game, but look what's wrapped around it in the, in the stand. Look at the way it's played. Differences develop. You can see it in soccer. Um, it's also then the problem of federations and associations at the national level making decisions that push pretty much all the sports into a global setting, um, be it the Olympic Games, be it the series of World Cups. The idea then of boycotts of, you know, at the current moment, banning Russia 40 years ago, banning South Africa. People are making, you know, avowedly political decisions about what sport's for, who can be included and who cannot be included. And I think, again, that goes back to the point, you've got to take the big history here. And I think Ron and Joy's point earlier about clubs is absolutely critical in understanding why sport is political. The first clubs are not political, capital P, but when they decide we're forming a club, they decide who's in and who's out. And you're out normally on the basis of gender, and then possibly on issues of religion and race. Now, that change and liberalises over 150 years, but again, it's something that's hardwired to sport. Sport, oh, we're apolitical. But sports bodies are constantly making political decisions. And usually it's about inclusion and exclusion. Yeah, I just want to quickly jump in and add to what um, Mike was saying, you know, the contrast between the Irish context and, and India. So in Ireland, there was a conscious shunning of the so-called British sports and, and, and an adoption of you know, so-called indigenous sports. Whereas in India, um, of course, you had indigenous sports being played at, at, at a certain level. But uh, from fairly early on, you know, of course, the elites initially took to the British sports. You know, one of the things was to get closer to the, the colonial administrators. So when people played polo, cricket, whatever, uh, you know, you had proximity to, to sort of people in the sort of highest echelons of power. Uh, and, and that's quite reasonably, you know, well documented. But also from, you know, fairly early on, 1880s, 1890s, uh, the Indians are also seeing 
in the sporting arena, the sporting field, as a way to compete against the British and, and to beat or best the British. So in a sense, using their sports to make a statement. So instead of shunning that sport, so even as Anglophile community as the Parsis, uh, when they beat uh, a cricket you know, team of the Parsis, beat a visiting uh, uh, British team in 1890, uh, there are great celebrations and there are some sort of notions of nationalism associated with and two decades later, and which is probably the kind of the, the, the sort of canonical event uh, in, in sort of Indian sporting history is when the Calcutta soccer football club Mohan Bagan beats this British regimental team, the East Yorkshire regiment team in 1911 in the sort of premier football tournament of the time, the IFA Shield. That is seen as a hugely important moment for internationalism and that's how it described in, in, in both sort of uh, regional newspapers as well as English newspapers. In fact, in one paper goes to the extent of saying what the Congress, in the National Congress, and the, and the proponents of Swadeshi have not been able to do so. The Mohan Bagan team has done so, beating the British at, you know, what to describe as sort of the quintessentially sort of British game of soccer. Um, so there is that element, you know, competing with the British and beating the British, and that is that comes through in, in several contests sort of across different sports, but, but most particularly in the team sports, which used to you know, generate the most passion as well as you know, the more, more, more spectators, namely cricket um, and soccer. Um, yeah, uh, I think this, this contrast is very interesting because we see completely different strategies being applied in the two countries. Ireland that trying to build a national identity around shunning the British sport and trying to promote Irish sport. Whereas in India, uh, a part of the colonial anti-colonial movement is trying to better the British at their game. So I think a question that arises at this time is, and this is sort of to both of you, as to why the other thing did not happen in the respective country. In Ireland, why did they not, for instance, try to uh, do the same thing as was done in India, trying to beat the British at their games? Or in India, why did they not try to see the playing of uh, British sports by Indians as something that was falling into their trap and instead trying to promote indigenous sport, for instance? So is there sort of uh, any thoughts on why the other thing did not happen in, in either country. I think, I mean, I think some of it just timing, um, but clearly the sporting revolution, 1860s, 70s, 80s, coincides perfectly with the rise of kind of an Irish nationalist movement, which is really going somewhere. Um, that there is a real correlation in the language around the foundation of the GAA, that they are preparing young Irish men for military participation. Okay, it might take another 25 years, but you are in that sense that you're, this, this, is, this is real. Uh, it's also possible because yes, rugby and soccer have arrived, but they're not, um, they're not yet kind of fully professionalized. There's not an Irish soccer team in the, in the British league, for example. So it, 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 it's at the early stage. Um, so I think some of it is just the pure timing of it. Um, it also fits in at the point where alongside the rejection of British sport, you've got the cultural revival. So you've got the rejection of British theatre, you've got the rejection of British drama. So, you know, within the cultural revival, it throws up figures like Lady Gregory, like John Milligan Singh, like W.V. Yates, the whole idea there will be an Irish theatre for Irish people. And that's either uh, plays written by Irish men and women or plays performed in the Irish language. So you're clearly, it's, for, it's, it's part of a much wider kind of rejection. Um, and it's really kind of moving into that push for political freedom from uh, the UK. Um, so I think that's my sense of where sport is different in the Indian case. I'm sure I'll have more on the Indian one, but it's just that um, as it were, British control of Ireland, which is always radically different anyway, because proximity, geographic proximity, history, race, all kinds of issues. But by the time you get to the 1880s, it's starting to fracture. 
therefore that when sport comes in with this big political statement it's easier to kind of destroy if you like um those british uh pastimes traditions that are there and just i'm mean, just one thing very quickly as well i think um the kind of big the, the moment of the national victory against england against the mother country and that language that's used in india it's used, been used in australia etc uh it's quite interesting if you ask the average english person when did what was england's great defeat in soccer it's 1953 and it's when the hungarians beat england at wembley and it's the first time england are defeated at wembley uh what they forget is in 1948 the irish beat england one nil but it mentally rejected because ireland's still seen within the british framework as a home nation and I think, again, those kind of ideas of the big defeat, the big victory, depending on which side of the centre you are, it's how you're relating to the imperial centre. And the British-Irish relationship, for all its complexity, is distinct to the relationship between Britain and somewhere like India. So, again, I think there's kind of issues there. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a you know, very good answer to the you know, why this contrast happens, of course, in Ireland and India and their nationalisms have a, have a have their own very peculiar histories. And you know, Ireland's also due to the sort of proximity to England and you know there are various other other issues. But um, I think in India the elites who were initially at the sort of you know, the forefront of uh, nationalism, the Indian National Congress, etc., were well, I think to some extent far too steeped in in the sort of you know British you know, sort of social, political culture. And, uh, you know, so it was kind of natural for them to adopt and even valorize, you know, this, you know, people, Indians taking up, taking up, or taking two, you know, Western or British sports and then using it to, to, to better or best the, the, the British. Um, interestingly, one might add, so someone like Nehru, for instance, would very much fall in the category, he loved his cricket, you know, started in Harrow, et cetera was quite passionate about cricket, uh, even you know, post-1947. But Gandhi, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, on the other hand, uh, had actually, and of course, he had an aversion to sport in general. But you know, when there were sort of efforts made to you know, rally support for, for, say, a cricket tournament in, in Bombay, um, he was against it you know, for different reasons. It was not, the story is a bit complicated. And again, you know, there's this kind of incident where the Indian hockey team uh, needs to go to the Olympics uh, and is raising funds and they go to Gandhi and Gandhi says, you know, uh, something to the effect, I've never really heard of hockey. I've not, this is field hockey, of course. And, and he says, I've never watched a field hockey you know, uh, a match in my life. So, you know, I'm not going to sort of you know, get into this business of uh, trying to sponsor uh, or raising funds for the hockey team to go to the Olympics. So, I think there is that element. I think, by and large, the Indian elites were, were quite caught up in a mode of, of the uh, Western or British sport. And uh, Gandhi, in, in that sense, was probably an outlier. Uh, although we do see efforts at, uh, at popularizing the indigenous sport uh, in pockets of India, but they never really took on a pan Indian form, and neither did they garner the kind of popularity or say, you know, press coverage, etc., that Indian teams, when they were successful, had uh, were able to say in, in cricket or, or soccer or, or hockey. Um, right. So just one last question on this sort of trying to look back into the past bit is, uh, so we, we've discussed the Indian and the Irish examples in detail. Just was wondering if uh, both of you in your experiences have come across sort of similar examples uh, elsewhere in the world where, for instance, what happened in Ireland where uh, that was used as a means to sort of promote nationalism and uh, sort, sort of argue against uh, the whole colonial uh, uh, apparatus. Something similar happened elsewhere in the world and similarly trying to beat the Britishers or any other colonial uh, power at their own game being used as a means of anti-colonial struggle happening in different places in the world. So it will be helpful to have those examples. There are. Um, I think that the Irish case is very unique. 
where the, the sport is conceived as political. Um, I think probably the nearest comparison in terms of an Indigenous game that takes on huge meaning is probably Australian rules football, um, which is it, it, in its simplest form, it's just invented as a kind of winter, a form of winter training for cricket players. But as Aussie rules grows, uh, it becomes so wrapped up in uh, kind of white Australian hyper-masculinity mateship, all these kind of ideas that are crystallised within, you know, in a way, excessive Australian identities, but it's there. Um, I think the US case is far more complex. Um, you will read certain works that talk about American exceptionalism and try and position baseball and American football as an explicit rejection of Britishness. Um, it doesn't really work for me. America's been independent for too long by the time modern sport arrives. Um, I think they're natural adaptations. Um, I think British culture has been rejected long before sport starts. Um, I think it's more interesting that what you see is in the development of American sport, a process very akin to what happens in Britain, a big input from schools and colleges, um, and American football emerges from the colleges. Why Chronolog chronologically? Uh, a small group of colleges in the northeast of America are having an argument in the 1870s about whether they're playing a handling game or a kicking game, both of which have been codified in Britain by that point as rugby and soccer. In a way, they can't make up their minds, and Walter Camp adapts it, and you end up with American football. But there's various points before that where you can clearly say Yale are playing soccer, Harvard are playing rugby. Um, but I don't think it's got, it's not a colonial moment or an anti-colonial moment. Uh, so I think America, we do have to kind of park to one side as kind of exceptional. Uh, yeah, I, I agree uh, with, with, in general, with, with what Mike said, you know, I think the American example can, has been interpreted as, as a rejection of, of, of uh, British sports, but I think the story is, is more complicated than that. Um, I think the sort of Indian but the South Asian example of 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 uh, you know of 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 the um, you know these colonies trying to sort of beat the, the the British at their own game, I think you know I haven't come across sort of specific instances like say the 1911 Bombay game, but I've found similar sentiments in the the you know, so-called Commonwealth where beating a, a visiting team from from Britain is is a big deal. Uh, uh, and that could sort of translate into some kind of, if not nationalistic sentiments, but contributes to national pride. So I think that model is is not so uncommon. Although I would, if you sort of press me, I might be you know, hard pressed to sort of come up with concrete examples. But I've found these similar instances. Not that I've sort of gone looking out for them, but I think you know that 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 sentiment is there in in, in other parts of the of the empire. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. And I think the US example is definitely interesting because we do uh, in popular debates see that sort of narrative that it was a sort of rejection, but it's yeah, interesting just, to know. Yeah, just one thing very quickly. I, do, I mean, I think that kind of, as it were, not framing it, the, the, the kind of the victory over the mother country, I think it also flows two ways that I think you have the victory which is in the home country, but I think also given post Second World War immigration from colonial nations into the, into the UK, you also have really significant victories against the mother country in the mother country. And I think if you look at the whole idea of how it's played out, particularly with the West Indies, if you think about the kind of Windrush generation um, as a kind of influx of uh, immigrants from the various Caribbean islands. You have some sort of late 1950s into the 1960s, that moment whereby the West Indies are not simply playing at the Oval or Lords. They're playing in front of a crowd, of a crowd which is black, which is their people. Uh, and it, it's interesting the way the kind of the British media charts their way around this because of these people at one level are, as it were, part of empire, part of us and yet are cheering on their side. And I think that the, the, 
the messages and the messaging around international sports victories really does start revolving around where it is and who's watching. Uh, and I think kind of global migration, and you see that increasingly, uh, global migration has a real impact on sporting venues, sporting crowds. Yeah, and I just want to quickly add that, you know, um, that's important, you know, sort of putting the sort of so-called mother country in their own sort of setting. And I think, you know, you have sort of two instances that one can quickly mention in India sort of beats Great Britain in, in hockey in the finals of the 1948 Olympics in London. A great moment for India. But, you know, I guess if you ask someone from, from Britain, you know, I don't think they'll probably remember, and you know, too many people wouldn't sort of talk about it as a significant event, but for independent, sort of decolonized, newly decolonized India, that was a big moment. And again, if you, you know, go further on a few decades in 1971, when India beats England for the first time in England, uh, in cricket, that's a huge moment. You know, I was sort of, you know, I was searching my book, I was looking at the newspaper records of the time, you know, front page, you know, tremendous coverage, but again, you know, if you talk to someone from England, you know, I guess cricket fans might remember it, but I mean, it wouldn't sort of be part of their sort of a significant part of their sort of cricketing history, but a huge moment for, 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 for India, uh, post-colonial independence. Um, yeah, I think that we can continue to keep talking about those sort of instances. So let's move forward. I think uh, in terms of looking forward, and in the present uh, about the development of sporting cultures and uh, indigenous sports. So we do know that the Gaelic uh, Athletic Association sort of is there, it sort of promotes uh, Irish sports. It's going great from what I understand, et cetera. I was just wondering in terms of uh, sustaining these local indigenous games, sports, pastimes, is it sort of possible to do so in the sort of modern world with, with all the commercial power behind certain specific sports, game going global, the whole digital revolution? Uh, how much of it is, again, it, we come back to the question of sporting culture. What is it that we consider sporting culture, I think? Uh, if it is just about participation, then maybe yes. But in terms of uh, professional level, and in terms of commercial success, can we view sporting culture to be something that allows for simultaneous existence of the modern sort of commercial sports as well as uh, some bits of these traditional sports? And I think uh, Dr. Sain, you touched on this earlier in terms of how things have changed since you wrote your book and how uh, uh, sports like Kho Kho and Kabaddi are sort of coming up. So what do you see in the future and how do you think these things can simultaneously coexist uh, both at the professional or the amateur level and in terms of sporting culture and i think in terms of indigenous sports uh, it's only kabaddi which i arguably has a pan indian uh, national footprint and most of us again in this sort of virtual room are aware of the you know, pro kabaddi league you know it sort of models itself on the ipl begins in 2014 and I've seen some numbers at the time that, you know, the audience that the, the, the Kabaddi League got in 2014 was not, you know, it was less than what the IPL got, but uh, not by too much. So it was incredibly popular and it has sort of grown in leaps and bounds. You now have a new sponsor. Uh, ironically, it's the Chinese company Vivo, right, which sponsors the Kabaddi League, I think it's been doing so from 2021. Um, so besides Kabaddi, I think the other, you know, sort of so-called traditional indigenous sports, uh, boat racing, Mirali Kaptu in Tamil Nadu, um, the other, uh, other sort of smaller sports. And I think they are still fairly niche sports confined to a particular region or a locality. And you know, I don't yet see them sort of going beyond that. Uh, they don't have the kind of uh, audience or interest level. Uh, but Kabaddi is really one sport which I think does, uh, is played and you know, watched by vast segments of India's population. Although I don't you know, see it as sort of challenging the popularity of you know, cricket in 
in the near future, but it does have you know, a sort of potential to be a, a national you know, a sport that's widely watched and played nationally. Yeah, I think um, just take a step back. The Gaelic Athletic Association was really worried in the late 1980s, 1990s when the Irish soccer team started qualifying for major international tournaments. So the ATA Championships in Europe, the 1990 and 1994 World Cup. And I think they had nightmares that, you know, little 11 year old boys would start wearing green jerseys and playing soccer. Um, and what they did was they readjusted their corporate structure. And they actually traveled around the world and went up to places like Liverpool and the Boston Red Sox and they went to the IOC. How does modern sport work and sell? And they weren't trying to sell Gaelic games to the world. They weren't trying to compete with the NFL or anything crazy. They were just trying to assure their own space. Uh, net results, if you go back to that period in the 1980s, 1990s, when they were worried, because their biggest income at that point was gate receipts, they only allowed four games a year to go onto TV. They wanted people in the grounds. The one thing they learned from the challenge of soccer was, you've got to be on TV. Advertising review, everything that flows from it. So that by this time, you know, we get to this season, 2022, pretty much two thirds of all championship games in Gaelic games were on TV. Okay. Um, I think also it's changed that people have become far more um, open to a post-nationalist culture, and that includes sport, so that you have Ireland, like everywhere, is bombarded with sport when you turn on your TV. I don't think there's any contradiction here for an Irish person to stand in about February in their rugby jersey and cheer on the Irish national team, uh, to then worry about towards the end of May which Irish players or their favourite team in England is doing best in soccer, to then jump into the Gaelic game season during the summer. I think that it's just all consumption. Uh, participation rates, um, the GEA still completely outstrips rugby and soccer. So fast forward, and I don't think that will change because it's part of tradition, as long as the people are keeping up with the marketing skills uh, about kind of bringing in children, those kind of shared histories and stories we tell. Um, and I think, you know, if you unpack that globally, again, I think the US is always an interesting model that if you think of, you know, the big three, probably football, baseball, um, basketball, soccer languishing in fourth, if not fifth place, has pumped millions, if not by this point, billions of dollars into trying to promote soccer within the US. 1994 World Cup and the 2026, wherever we are, um, the MLS is now in its second incarnation. It's ticking along okay. But if you look at the numbers, is it making any attempts or any kind of headway into getting to third place, let alone first? No. And you can't see, unless there is some major, major crisis within American football, for example, where concussion becomes this absolute critical issue where it has to be so radically changed as a game that it falls out of favour, you just can't see soccer making headway. Okay, yes, I can like teach Americans, you know. Most American students I would teach now played soccer, irrespective of their gender, up to the age of about 14 because their parents like it. It's a non-contact sport. But what sports when they get to college? It's football. It's basketball. It's the traditional American games. So yes, they have a familiarity with soccer, they might even talk about which soccer team they get up to watch on a Saturday morning in the EPL, but it doesn't translate to going down to their local ground in the MLS in any great way. And if you look at the MLS's greatest success, it's been in major cities where there is not a football team or a ice hockey team, etc. So I think this idea of going back to the idea I mentioned earlier, it's kind of what sport gets in first, it will have challenges undoubtedly as we move forward through the next 10, 20 years. But it really, I personally don't see the sporting landscape being radically changed anytime soon, just because of tradition. You know, it's very difficult. If you are a supporter of a game and you love it, and that's the game you discuss with your friends and your family, you're not going to just suddenly jump up and say, oh, I'm going to start watching ice hockey. 
if you live in Australia. It's not, that's not how people work. Um, and those traditions, I think, of different sports in different places are so entrenched now and also so well marketed and also giving you your narrative through news stories, through online feed and giving you your heroes and anti-heroes, your villains. You can't just stop that and supplant it with something else. So in that sense, I think the sports world continues. There'll be developments, there'll be new ways of looking at it. But I think the kind of literal order in most nations of which is the most popular sport is unlikely to change. Uh, no, I, I think that that is what I had also thought about it. I keep thinking about it and I think that's probably true. It's very difficult to sort of change from where we are right now and go to somewhere else. But I think this is also a good opportunity for us to probably end the discussion and go into the Q&A because we'll want to end on time. So uh, I, I'll raise a few questions and I think uh, we can have quick answers. And I'll first raise a question, I think that directly relates to what we are talking right now, is in terms of whether uh, a project like the GA oral history project, uh, which sort of focused on documenting the lives of people, the association with GA, et cetera, can something like that happen in, in a big country like India where we think about documenting sporting history at the grassroots and can something like that be used as as a springboard to sort of bring these lost games or being these indigenous games to the fore and try to develop them and make them popular very quickly uh, i think such initiatives could, could work but only on a again as i said a localized sort of regional uh, setting i don't think it will become you know just compare, as you rightly said, in India's size, etc., compared to Ireland, it's difficult to get any a national footprint for anything. So it wouldn't be easy. But um, I think what also needs to be done is I think that question I was hinting at. You know, I don't think we still have found ways and language to sort of look at, you know, sort of indigenous or popular sports at the grassroots level. You know, so we've had this sort of famous or you know, well known, you know, subaltern school of history, right? Mm. In, 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 in just 11 or 12 volume, but we probably need something like that uh, specifically for sports. So in the subaltern history, I don't think there's any, not a single article on, 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 on sports, it is it's sort of more so-called serious issues like, you know, with looking at the uh, sort of tribal movements, looking at labor, et cetera, but there is, uh, so I think there is that gap and that is something that probably historians, sociologists, and particularly anthropologists slash ethnographers might might look at. Yeah, I think I mean very quickly the the GA oral history project worked because Ireland's a very small place. Um, you have on the island two thousand clubs. Um, we obviously interviewed a lot of people ourselves within the core team, but because they are a voluntary a volunteer community organisation, um, they also were happy to do interviews themselves. So we had volunteers who were in our own community working up our questionnaires. So in that sense, it's, it's scale is important. I mean, I think it's, um, it's scale and also the type of organization. I think it's very difficult to do with um, professional sport because it's about access. Um, and certainly, you know, Ireland helps because it's tiny. Um, yeah, that's, that's true. Um, so I think the next question is something that we have discussed in terms of how the entire sporting project has been quite political in various different forms in how the sort of players interact with it, how the administrators interact with it, and how the sort of colonial apparatus interacts with it. So I think the question is uh, more in terms of modern sports, which is if the panelists, uh, do the panelists agree that elite sports uh, persons have a duty to remain neutral on political and social issues uh, and not use their social capital to simply support the ruling class, especially in cases where they have no business of making a public statement. Um, I don't know whether my, I can just quickly step in and say, I think in India, and in fact, I've been working on a paper with a couple of you know, scholars who work on social media and looking at sort of uh, specifically the, the phenomenon that's mentioned, you know, tweets, sort of yep. uniform tweets. Exactly. You know, the same tweets by sports, famous sports persons, you know, supporting, you know, maybe a government initiative or, or, or something like that. And, and uh, I think uh, in, in, in India, there, you know, that can often happen because sports persons are, are quite deeply 
so involved and, and has a deep relationship with the, with the state, you know, sometimes as patrons, um, sometimes otherwise. And it's often very difficult for them to, you know, sort of, uh, you know, criticize, you know, state policy, government policy. And, you know, I don't, we don't have much time, but, you know, one of the things we know is that the political class in India is also deeply involved in the running of sports in India, yeah. which is quite different from, so, you know, cricket, for example, if you look at the various state boards, as well as the, the, the national, you know, the, the BCCI, yeah. you have, you know, either politicians or relatives or nephews or sons of, and I'm not taking names of very prominent politicians uh, uh, on, in, in, in the nutrition. So it's very difficult for a cricketer uh, or uh, another sports person to, you know, say something critical because, you know, uh, you know the place in the team might, might be on the line or, you know, hypothetically, I'm not saying that might happen. But I think there is that sort of fear of, 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 of being critical of, of, of the state. I don't know whether that's sort of translates into other uh, you know, sporting cultures and issues you might, might have a view on that. Yeah, I mean, the history is littered with athletes who took a political stance and didn't really have a career afterwards. Um, you know, you look back on Tommy Smith, uh, John Carlos from the 68 Olympic and the Black Power salute, career ending, Kaepernick in America taking the career ending. Um, there's a real, you know, sports are kind of a very closed world. And all those kind of rules we were talking about earlier are not just simply about rules, how you conduct yourself on the field of play. Um, they're quite often for most modern contemporary athletes, they're contractual rules about your salary. And if you misbehave, even if it's a political cause you believe in, that's going to create real problems. Uh, and I think you see that within uh, the kind of real questions around Qatar hosting the World Cup. I think, you know, any right minded person will have deep concerns about that. Uh, and what's gone on in and around it on human rights issues, on migrant workers and so on. Um, but equally, I can't see it. There's not going to be a single professional footballer who's going to put their hand up and say, I'm not going, because that's going to create real problems for their you know, future employment, their income and so on and so forth. Um, I think something like the Norwegian, uh, the chair of the Norwegian FA, who stood up in the FIFA meeting and called it out, was brilliant, but I think it's that that it's for administrators to make those stances. I think rather than athletes, um, you know. Again, I think the one wonder problem with athletes, we kind of uh, in, I was always my kind of interested. We imbue athletes with all these kind of values. Um, they should kind of be well behaved. They should be correct. They should follow the rules. They should, you know, be purely formed, perfect individuals, um, and in a way have the correct political views on everything. You know, the average athlete. 22 years old and done little else with their life and yet we're asking them to behave as if they're Nelson, Danda, Mad, Nelson Mandela mixed, mixed with Socrates kind of thing it's 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 not real um and I think that's why the, you know while the sports world has all this kind of media power the people who occupy that space are not necessarily the kinds of people for various reasons who can become you know outspokenly politically activist I think there's one interesting thing you mentioned there is about how it's for the administrators to stand up. And I think uh, Dr. Sain already pointed out how that's perhaps totally impossible in India, given how the administrators are sort of completely captured in some sense by the political class. So uh, that presents another set of problems, but yeah, uh, not for now to discuss. Uh, and I think we have the last question uh, from one of our viewers today is uh, about more sort of historical question, I think, which is uh, in what ways have the political conflict in the with the UK and the time during the Troubles uh, affected the sport culture in Ireland and Northern Ireland, uh, respectively? Uh, sort of, is there a distinction in terms of how those two boats went about their sporting cultures? Uh, very quickly, without turning into a three-hour lecture. Um, Clearly, the issue around the history of sport on this island is that between 1916 1923 in the South, what is now the Republic, you had a war against the British. Between 1968 and 1998, you had a long running sectarian conflict that involved the British state forces. Um, in a way, the remarkable thing is sport continued. Um, both those periods are littered with examples of sports people uh, being politically active. 
being killed, being imprisoned. Um, I think where it comes down to is actually once we get through those longer periods, it's actually about identity politics. Um, but because of the historical roots of something like the GAA and then the history of Ireland politically, its relationship with Britain, uh, sport is largely not completely divided along sectarian lines. So if, if you if you if I tomorrow met a Catholic, I'm sorry, if I on Monday met a Catholic in Northern Ireland and said, did you watch the game? The implied question is, did I watch the GA? You know, whereas with a Protestant, it's more likely to be rugby. Now that's loosening now as we move into a much longer kind of post-conflict zone. But, you know, in this country, on this island rather, 90% of schooling is denominational. If you go to a Catholic school, you play GAA. If you go to a Protestant school, you play rugby, which means from the start of us being kids, your sporting cultures are separate. Um, so the kind of politics around that are very, very complex. And you had the example a few years ago uh, when FIFA introduced a rule that all uh, teams competing in FIFA competitions at the international level, the squad had to all have the right national passport. So if you had the Indian team, they had to have you know, a squad of 24 should have 24 Indian passports. Uh, in Northern Ireland, you choose, it's a personal choice, are you British or you're Irish? That was one way of creating parity of esteem around identity. And simply put, the Catholic players, the players who self-identified as Irish, said they would not play for Northern Ireland if people insisted on them having a British passport. So that, those kind of identity politics, which are a product of conflict, are still playing out. Um, yeah, thanks for that. Uh, just, I think two more questions have come in. I'll just combine them and ask you uh, if you could sort of uh, answer in the next couple of minutes or so. In terms of uh, what do the panelists see the role of schools in building a culture of sports? And if uh, somebody wanted to go and present an argument to a school leader, about the importance of sport, what argument would they present? And slightly related, but not exactly the same, is in terms of the movement uh, in India towards Olympic sports in the recent years. And does this sort of indicate a shift in the changing national sporting culture uh, away from the sort of uh, colonial lens to somewhat more nationalistic lens? Oh, you know, very quickly for the to the second one. Uh, you know, I I don't see it in sort of that linear fashion. I think there's a generally I think a greater awareness about sports and 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 the way it's tied to uh, to nationalism, to national pride. So I think uh, and that's also sort of consciously messaged uh, in these days uh, compared to say maybe two or three decades ago. Uh, so, um, so I think that, in a sense, is contributing to part of this sort of interest in Olympic sports. But also, I would say it's tied. You know, there's a not you can look at it non-nationalistic lens too. This ties in a little bit to that school question. You know, I think the effect, you know, so-called effect of participating population in sport in India has also been increasing, right? So, nutrition levels, health, education, you know, all these are, are are required or a necessity. For, for uh, people, particularly kids, to take part in sport. And that has been happening uh, through general rise in those levels, but also, I think, the active role of the, of the state in, in, in sort of pushing sport. And so that's my quick response. I know we're running out of time. Yeah, I think on school sport, um, it's very complex. I mean, if you look at Ireland, for example, the Irish rugby team at the minute is ranked one in the world. Uh, since the era of rugby professionalism in the 1990s, pretty much every single player that's played from Ireland has come from a very, very elite, very expensive fee-paying school. Uh, a large part of the fees and alumni donations go into making sure the rugby team is very, very well looked after. Uh, and there's almost a correlation now between boys emerging age 15, 16, and then being handpicked for county development, sorry, provincial development squads, which will then get them into the Irish team. So we're professionalizing uh, boys, in this case, very early on, uh, and that takes huge amounts of resources. Now that is a particular product of a very elite, very private, very expensive educational system, which I have problems with. I think when you look at mass schooling, uh, the job of education should be education, not necessarily creating 
elite sports people or potential elite sports people. I think the idea of sport education should be about fitness. Uh, I think also some of the things we talked about here, just the kind of sheer largesse and power of international sports bodies, be it FIFA, be it the IOC, and then at the level of teams and leagues in national settings, sport is incredibly wealthy. And I think the idea that the state, if the state funds education, should be responsible for developing sports people between the ages of four and 18 is a nonsense. I think in this day and age, the sports bodies themselves should be paying for it. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, both of you. I think I'll not keep uh, keep you waiting for too long. I'll just pass on quickly to Yogita to say the final words. But thank you so much. It was lovely having the conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Sen, Professor Cronin, and Shubham for this very insightful session. Thank you to all our viewers as well for tuning in. This brings us to the end of this session. The Sports Law and Policy Center, along with the PIC, looks forward to hosting you all again very soon. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.